The topic I chose for today is industry myth busting um, because I, I think indeed, as Sven mentioned, it's interesting how as a community, as a professional community, um, we are working and are continuing to work in certain ways because of certain reasons, but it's not always that clear how or why. Um, I've been at GoTo as a speaker uh, regularly, actually, but usually my talks are a bit different. I usually talk about more deep technical subjects, where I just uh, more as a trainer, I explain things to people. Um, but uh, I work for Trifork as a CTO. We organize the conference. Um, so this is actually my first keynote opportunity. So what I want to do today is I want to practice my, my thought leadership skills a bit more, because I, I don't really get to do it that often. And I thought myth busting would be a nice way to actually address some of the things that I, I really want to share with you. So you're probably familiar with the show Mythbusters, even if you haven't seen it. It's the idea that we are debunking these common misconceptions, and I think we have a lot of them when it comes to software development. Um, I have personally been working in the space of doing professional software engineering enterprise application development since 1999. And it's actually a bit weird to realize this, but that means I started in the previous century, when probably a lot of you weren't even born yet. And there were times when 1999 actually seemed like quite far away, but we are way past those times. So just to give you a bit of perspective, obviously, which I didn't even put on the slides, 1999 was the year when we were preparing for the year 2000 problem. And um, I actually just graduated in 1999, and I saw tons of my uh, uh, fellow students actually dropping out of college just to learn a bit of COBOL so that they could all get well-paid jobs to work on fixing the Y2K problems. Um, that apparently worked, because in the end, the problem wasn't actually that bad. But there were a lot of things happening then. There was the very first wiki page was being published in 1999. We had the Melissa virus. For those of you into Linux, at the time, I was a very avid Linux user, they came up with the common Unix printing system, CUPS, which is, as far as I know, still a thing. And I, I always joke to people who are still using Linux on their laptops that if they can get something to actually print out in color, they've passed their exam. Um, Napster was being sued. This, um, TLS was being invented, right? Oftentimes, we're still talking about HTTPS as being HTTP over SSL. Actually, TLS has been there now for, for 24 years already. SVG image format was invented, just to give you a bit of context. And I like to think that because of all of this experience, right, when I get all of these new people fresh out of college into, into the company, um, I'm sort of like this guy, right? I've seen things you wouldn't believe. Um, and that comes into the, the thought leadership image that I'm trying to project here. Um, Obviously, it doesn't oftentimes really work out like that. And in practice, it will be more like this, right? Yeah, you know, it's just like your opinion, man. The dude uh, that you may be familiar with. Actually, as you will see, uh, my goal for today is that at the end of my presentation, this is what you're going to be feeling like. But you're not just going to be feeling this towards me. You're going to be feeling this towards most of the presenters here at the conference. That's actually the goal I'm going after. Um, also, Taking this scale a bit further, that might actually lead you to think that I'm more like this person. For those of you not familiar with what this is, this is old man yells at cloud. So at the risk of becoming the old man yelling at the cloud, I'm going to start my talk now. The first thing I want to address is something that at conferences like this has been discussed for a decade already. It's microservices versus monoliths. Right, always a nice topic that people have very strong opinions about. And um, for me, um, learning about microservices and the idea of microservices and seeing people talk about this stuff was around 2013. I'm sure things happened before then, but this is when I picked up, mostly from uh, people working for ThoughtWorks, uh, talking about this stuff at conferences. Uh, you had James Lewis doing mostly like microservices where services were still doing peer-to-peer, um, uh, -peer, direct RPC-like calls. Uh, but there was also people like Fred George who were already at that time experimenting with stuff like Kafka, doing event-based, uh, highly asynchronous systems. And um, it was then that we all learned that apparently until then, we had all been building these monoliths, right? People didn't really use the term monolith, 
until they needed a term to describe what they had been doing so far when, when microservices became a thing. And um, the term microservices and the idea of picking this up and starting to do this uh, was having an incredible traction. A lot of people, myself included, were very much drawn to these ideas. And, and the reason for that was we, I think, as a community, we recognized all of the problems that people were trying to solve with microservices, right? We weren't necessarily convinced that microservices would fix them, but at least we could very much um, uh, imagine and resonate it with the problems that, were, that people were trying to address. Uh, speed of development being a very important one, right? It's very often that when people work on especially existing software in companies, that they, it sort of bugs down into this thing where it becomes harder and harder to get more functionality, more changes in. People feel like they're just working for a feature factory. Um, and, uh, and getting codes to ship to production, which ultimately the goal, of course, of every software developer became, became hard. Also, scaling development. Right? It's one thing to build a system with three, four people. It's another thing to build something with three, four teams already. Um, and scaling up is, is a hard thing, inherently hard. And this was aiming to address some of the challenges that you have there. Uh, technology choices, right? maybe we don't all want to use the same stack, or maybe we feel that we are being held back by some technology choices of the past that are hard to change, right? We saw in, uh, for those of you that were at um, uh, Daniel Bryan's talk, we saw the uh, explanation of a, of a phrase called uh, first, I think it was first level choice. It's these things that are, once you make the choice, it's actually very hard to revert. And this happens in technology quite a lot, actually. And having the opportunity to take new choices for new things that you do is, is huge, right? And there were all of these other, these other touted benefits. And, and people set off, I think, doing microservices, just hoping that they would magically get all of these benefits. And obviously, we're, we're very disappointed when that didn't really happen. And I think um, part of the reason for, for that just not simply happening apart from being a bit naive, maybe, is that people weren't really thinking about, but what are my goals? I did a talk last year here at GoTo, which was more of a case study on a system that we have been developing and are still developing for the uh, Nederlands Loterij, the Dutch Lotteries, where we're building an integration platform. That's over 30 microservices that we are building with one team. And it's currently quite a small team, actually. Um, it's all running on the same tech stack. It's all Spring Boots with Java, because that is what we're good at. Um, so a lot of the reasons that I just mentioned don't really apply to what we're doing. And still, we feel that it has a lot of benefit for us to do microservices because we had certain goals in mind. So our goals, for example, were to only run what's relevant when you are doing local development. If you are building a very big system, even if it's well composed, if it's well thought of, if it's modularized, you still need to run that thing. You need to start it up if you actually want to see what it's doing. And that can take a lot of time if you're working on just a very small section of that system. Uh, when you have microservices that are properly separated, you can simply run what's needed. You don't need to really care about the other stuff. And when I say don't really care about the other stuff, what I find is that that very often can even mean you don't need to know even about the other stuff. What we're building is a platform that actually serves an entire company for all sorts of different use cases. And some of those parts, after having been developed a couple of years ago, are fairly stable. We don't really work on them on a day-to-day -day basis anymore. I have people in my team who literally have never seen maybe 50% of the code that is in our code base, simply because they, they haven't had any need to actually look into that and to see how it works. They can dive into that if they have to, and it will be small enough that they can actually learn about it, but they don't need to know everything in order to work on something. I think that's a very important goal for me. Um, we had other reasons, I, I won't go at the whole thing. Uh, per service scalability is actually quite a common reason, but the reason I wanted to mention that one is that it's actually very uncommon for us. This is one of the very few systems that I've worked on as an architect, where it was actually important that we could say at that part, that really needs to be able to horizontally scale up to a very large volume, because we have these weird peak loads. Tenths of the month, uh, there is a state lottery draw, and at 10 o'clock in the evening, exactly, there is over a million people in the Netherlands who want to see if they won the lottery. And they will all log in at the same time. There's a huge load on the system. It's predictable. It's very nice that we can just scale up parts of the system, and we don't need to do that for everything. But this is not very common, actually. Most of the systems that we build don't really have this requirement. Um, so 
that probably goes for a lot of the things that you are building as well. Stuff like limiting the blast radius is something that I don't really see that often being mentioned. For us, very important. We have had services that use third-party libraries, uh, third-party frameworks, that sort of thing, that had memory leaks, for example. In that case, it's really nice if such a service fails that it fails on its own. It doesn't actually take down the whole system, right? Because if you are building a single system, yeah, even if you scale it up, horizontally, that can still become a single point of failure if there is a problem within the service itself. Um, so something I want to really address in this, in this talk is you always need to consider what are your goals. And you need to consider that when you make choices in your projects, but you also need to consider that when you listen to people like me and all of the other speakers here at the conference when they are telling you, hey, this is what you should be doing, we have this way of working, we have this set of technologies, we have this thing. Always try to immediately think, OK, how does that fit into my context? What are my goals? And also, what are the constraints that were originally there when people said, hey, you know what? This is really a good idea. And those constraints change. And they can sometimes change, I think, quite dramatically in a relatively short period of time. You probably, if you have been looking into microservices and things over the past couple of years, you probably know this picture. It says you need to be at least this tall to use microservices. And what that means is that a lot of people failed in the beginning when they were trying out microservices because it requires a lot of practices and things to be in place. You need automated builds. You need automated delivery. Uh, you need observability so that you can actually see what your stuff is doing at runtime. You need a lot of those things. And at the time, like 10 years ago, this wasn't really that much of a common practice for a lot of people, so it made sense to to say that, oh, but maybe you should think about doing this before you are addressing this. Nowadays, somewhat to my surprise actually, but I'm positively surprised by this, continuous integration and continuous deployment seems to be everywhere. Right? I'm also a trainer, I used to do trainings where 10 years ago I would ask people, do you even have an automated build? And then I would ask them, do you, do you run it continuously? Do you have something like a CI server? Nowadays, this is pretty much a given. Even at companies that are traditionally slow in picking up new technologies, I've seen banks and insurances, they're just running Azure DevOps pipelines like it's nothing. The adoption of this stuff has been amazing. Um, and everyone is deploying onto a platform like Kubernetes, right? Again, this was a very unsure space for a very long time. I went to Daniel's talk. He talked about things like Massos, for example. Uh, you're probably familiar with some of these other platforms if you've been into this space. This has pretty much consolidated onto this, and now the next level where we are expecting consolidation is what happens on top to actually make this more of a, of a pass. Um, but that means that uh, a lot of this stuff is solved. Kubernetes, in that sense, is interesting, I think, because <laughs> there is a lot of rightful critique. Actually, I thought about putting in the slide from Dan North comparing it to WebSphere, uh, but I didn't, but it was in Dan's talk already. Um, I think that's a bit of an easy joke to make and a bit of a lazy thought leadership from Dan, maybe, because they're not really that much the same thing. But it is a very complex solution that was built in a particular context, which is massively adopted by the world. And that's interesting. It's like VHS. For those of you not old enough to remember that, this was a videotape format that competed against uh, Betamax and against uh, P2000 from Philips. And for various reasons, where quality and technical excellence were not two of them, they won. Right? For example, I think Philips actually refused to bring out porn on their videotaping system. That cost them a lot. I cannot really make the analogy to that to Kubernetes. I, tr I really try, so I can't. But for some reason, Kubernetes won. Um, but the interesting thing there is that I think a lot of those original constraints that said, Ho, 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 maybe you shouldn't be doing this microservices stuff just yet. Maybe you should be a bit more careful. They don't really apply anymore. This, for a lot of companies, this seems like a solved problem. That doesn't mean that the ecosystem isn't continuously evolving, right? We still have stuff like where do service meshes go, how does serverless fit into this, all of that. But to just get a new service from scratch into a repo, into a pipeline, rolled out to production for a lot of companies, it's not actually hard anymore. Uh, and that, that really changes the game. It means that instead of thinking, why should I not be doing this, you get this whole landscape of options where you think, okay, but given that I can apparently do all of this from the traditional monolith stuff all the way to small services, 
why should I be doing this? Um, I saw a comment recently from uh, DH, the um, creator of the Rails framework, who sort of has an invested interest in promoting uh, monolith systems from that point of view, and is also has very strong opinions on pretty much everything, saying um, this only last week, where he said, yeah, but if you cannot really build this majestic monolith where you have everything like, nicely done when it comes to uh, separation of concerns, having good code quality, yeah, you're just going to make a mess if you're distributing this thing. I think this, is a very, this, is, this would have been a good statement like eight years ago. Nowadays, I'm not so sure that this is an interesting comment to make anymore because I don't think a lot of companies there are thinking, yeah, you know what, I have this, this, this big ball of mud it's probably going to get better if I change it into microservices. This is not something that people are still doing and still thinking. There are other, unfortunately, much better reasons for actually moving into microservices than saying, I want to clean up the mess that I have. Um, so even though this is true, it, it's just not an interesting, and it's not just an interesting opinion anymore. So what you're seeing is you're seeing this, this, this wave of, of things happening. And at the same time, what I also see, very interesting, is that finally now that people who have been bitten by microservices and say, yeah, this appears not to really bring out the goals that we were trying to achieve with it, they're now trying to think of better ways to actually build monoliths. Um, for many years in the Java space, for example, people have tried to do things like modular development using OSGI or using the Java 9 module system, which all of things, I, I think, was wasted effort. Um, it, it didn't bring anything good, it just brought a lot of overhead. But now people are really starting to think, but what does it mean to build betterly, better structured monolith systems? How can we do more stuff with CQRS event sourcing? How can we have more decoupling? Um, how can we actually have a structure where we can say, for example, I want to test like a vertical slice of my system rather than a horizontal slice of my system. All of these things are really important if you want to do this thing right. So we get this pendulum, but the nice thing about it is we actually get more choices as developers. The bad thing is we do need to consider what our goals are because there is so much to choose from. Right? And this is just one example. Another one, I think, is feature branches for strong based development. And I wrote this presentation, I think I started two weeks ago or something, and only then I noticed that there was actually a talk on this just before mine. So some people might have actually seen Claire's talk. It was exactly about this topic. So we're talking about, for those of you who are not familiar with this, we're talking about version control, or as old people used to call it, source control management, or SCM systems. Now, I want to give you just a little bit of background in, in my history of using version control. I started out doing Java in 1999 with something called Visual Age for Java. This is what it looked like. It was built by OTI. That was actually funded by uh, Dave Thomas. Not the Dave Thomas who was speaking this go-to, because he's the pragmatic Dave Thomas, but the Dave Thomas who has also been involved in the go-to program committee, actually. Um, this thing was written in Smalltalk. And the way that it worked is you didn't actually have any source code on your machine. The source code only lived on the server, and then you would just work with compiled code. The view that you would get on this was just individual Java methods. So for years, my whole notion of what the Java class was was completely distorted because of this tool. But the most interesting thing, uh, I think, is uh, this version control stuff. The reason I show this picture is you also see another failed attempt, I think, at um, doing visual programming. This is wiring stuff up. And I actually did a training course uh, at the time at the IBM uh, training center, where they had like OS2 warp machines for the internet. Um, and they had a trainer there that would look at, he would demo this stuff and then said, yes, this is really clean wiring, right? So instead of clean code, we would use to have clean wiring. This was a bad idea. Uh, the industry as a whole, I think, should feel bad about it. Um, but from there out, um, IBM also decided this is not really what we want. They came out with Eclipse-based tooling, and we had to choose as a team at the time, do we want to use CVS or do we want to use ClearCase? And we had no opinions on the stuff because we weren't familiar with either. I think we spent an hour trying to get CVS to run on our Windows and T machine. We couldn't, so we chose ClearCase. Right? Proper technical decision making. And this is, uh, this is ClearCase. And ClearCase actually had some nice characteristics. I, feel, I still feel, because I have done a ton of work even maintaining uh, ClearCase servers, uh, the branching model was actually pretty good. It had the notion of version directories. You could rename things. It would still be able to properly merge them back. Uh, actually quite nice. But it was also, it was dog slow. It was really super slow. But the most, the most annoying thing about this is that by default, this tool would use pessimistic locking. What does it mean? You had to explicitly take a lock on the file before you were allowed to change it. 
And by default, if you had luck, no one else could actually work on the same file. And then they also, on top of this tool, which the tool itself actually allowed for other ways to work, they had their unified change model or management model or something like that, which basically dictated that you had to do this. You had to do everything on branches. You had to always work in this way. And you had this pessimistic locking on files. Again, this was a very bad idea. They should feel really bad about it. Um, then we got Subversion, which was really just a, a better way of using uh, something like CVS, but without some of the downsides. And then Git happened. And for a lot of you, I imagine, this is the only thing you are familiar with. Version control nowadays is sort of a synonym for, for using Git. And it's, it's interesting because Git, was, of course, was, was built for a very specific reason. Linus Torvald created it to support the way of working that they have with the Linux kernel. And the tool that they were using became uh, for pay, so they didn't like that. And it's interesting because it's also one like Kubernetes. It's one of these complex tools, right? You're probably familiar with this. This is a joke, but still, it, it does show that um, Git is not like the obvious thing to choose if you want to just get some source control into place. Um, also resonates, this one from XKSD, it still resonates with me a lot. A lot of the times when I see people, and I, I often ask people also when I do trainings, like, okay, you're using Git, how do you use it? It's basically this. Yeah, we check out the project, we have this fixed workflow, I know I create a feature branch, I know how to do a checkout, I know how to do a Git and a, and a push. And if something goes wrong, <laughs> I typically just create a copy so I don't lose anything. And I throw away my code and I just check out the thing again. Because there aren't really that many people who really understand Git. And that makes sense because Git is an awfully complex piece to deal with. But it's, apparently it's, it became the industry standard. So it's, it's again, it's likely VHS, right? It didn't, I think, win because it was the, the best thing that was the easiest to use for people and it would address the common requirements. It, there were other reasons for this becoming as popular as it was. One of the reasons there was branching is really cheap in Git. It's really good at creating a branch. It costs you basically nothing to do. Um, so it doesn't need to literally copy over files. It doesn't need to uh, create a lot of resources. And it's also really good at doing stuff like merging. So branching became very cheap. But I think the main reason was GitHub. Uh, GitHub actually replaced all of the previous platforms for doing open source development that were there, like uh, uh, Source Tree and the, 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 a couple of companies. GitHub became the, like, the de facto way of developing software, and they were pushing this model. And they also made it easier to use. So people got adjusted to this workflow where you basically needed to first fork off a copy and then create a branch and then work on that and then create a merge request. But people got it because it was in the tool and it, it worked actually really well. Now in the enterprise, of course, when everyone started to use Git, but they were used to these complex tools, they said, yeah, but we need a way to work with this. I'm not sure if anyone still recognizes this, but this is Git flow. This is a, an idea that people had of this is a good way of working with Git. We're going to create all of these different types of branches. We're going to have a development branch. We're going to have feature branches off of that. But we're also going to have versions per release. We're going to have stabilization branches. We're basically going to use branches for everything because we can. <laughs> Branching is cheap now, right? And obviously, we want to have all of these things. Um, this didn't really work very well for most people. And I think, again, as a reaction to that, we saw a movement to exactly the opposite, which is trunk-based development. And we actually had a talk on that just before my keynote. I did attend it to make sure that I wasn't saying weird things uh, <laughs> in improperly referring to what was said there. But what I see is that this is like this is indeed an extreme move, right? And that's not necessarily always a good thing. People find that these things that don't work for them uh, can be changed by just going into the opposite direction, but a lot of people always take that to the extreme. So <laughs> I put this in, and I made sure to check if this was indeed what was said at the previous uh, presentation. And it was. If you're not doing trunk-based development, yeah, you're not doing continuous integration. Typically, it's, it's people that are, I think, sort of a bit of zealots who say this thing. Why do I say that? It is because, what does it mean to say you're not doing continuous integration? In my list of goals, as an architect, as a team lead, as a CTO, Nowhere does it have a checkbox to say, am I doing proper continuous integration? Continuous integration is, is a tool. It's a means to arrive somewhere. It's not a goal in itself, right? So if someone says you're not really doing continuous integration, what does that even mean? What are they accusing you of? 
It's like, oh yeah, but I have this one way where I think it's really important that you need to do this. I also think I'm the only one that has a proper understanding of the term. And now I'm going to enforce it upon you and I'm going to blame you for, for not actually doing this. And we see this a lot. It's, it's the same like saying, yeah, but if you're not using hypermedia, then is your API even restful? Uh, yeah, it's not that much of an interesting question. <laughs> People who ask this are right, right? Roy Fielding's thesis actually said, these are the five things that I define to be REST. It's very clear. And hypermedia, or hypermedia as the engine of application state was definitely one of them. In practice, when you go out there and you look at all of these various APIs that you are integrating with or that you are developing yourself, no one does this because it's too hard. It's not standardized. No one really knows how to do this properly. There are some big ideas, like there's the HAL standard in JSON, for example. Adoption is super low. In practice, the whole world has just adopted open API. We just put out all of our endpoints out there for the world to see. And people build clients against that, and uh, it actually works reasonably well. So that's what we do. Um, so what I'm looking for is a more reasonable alternative. Unfortunately, when it comes to something like version control, it's there, right? Also, on Martin Fowler, one of the people who invents terms like continuous integration because he's, he's really good at naming things uh, and then writing about it. Um, there is this article from uh, Rouen Wilsenach, I think it's pronounced, I'm not even sure. But he has this model which uh, is, is called ship show ask, right? Something doesn't exist until you give it a name. So the, the ship show ask says, well, you know, maybe we, for, for certain things, it makes a lot of sense actually to do trunk based development. We're just going to commit to main or master or trunk, if, if some of you even know what, <laughs> what trunk came from. Um, but that makes sense. But for other things, it actually makes sense to say, you know what, I'm going to develop this on a short lived feature branch. But then when I'm done, and I'm happy with it, and I've done some, maybe some refactorings, and done some tests, and I'm just going to merge it in. People can look at it later, maybe, maybe not, depends. But we can just do that. And for some other things, actually, it makes sense to get some feedback. We should have a second pair of eyes actually doing a proper review on this, for example. Reviewing, I also noticed that in the previous talk, it was frowned upon in this trunk-based development community as something that is just a bad practice because you're not pairing enough. Um, it doesn't resonate with me at all. Uh, I have done code reviews over my career for a very long time, and the value that I'm still nowadays getting out of code reviews is tremendous. But my experience is not your experience, right? It, it all depends on context. What I often see is that not everyone in the team is of the same experience level. Not everyone knows everything about the system. Not everyone knows everything about the technologies it's been developed with. It can really help to have someone to do some reviews on, on certain things to see are our project guidelines, are they, are they met? Some of that can be automated, obviously. And if, if it can, it should be. But that's hard, actually, for certain things, where a code review can provide really good feedback for people to say, ah, they need to take this into account, need to take that into account. Um, but you don't need to do it for everything, right? It doesn't make sense to say you always should work in exactly this one way because someone figured out it works for them. So when it comes to something like version control, I think feature release frequency is really important. Lots of companies are trying to get things out as quickly as possible. And obviously, it makes sense to merge things very quickly. I have also worked on a medical record system for elderly healthcare where they did like, I think, three or four feature releases per year. Of course, they did other releases more often, but big new features were only introduced that often. And their customers did not complain about getting so few releases. Their customers struggled to keep up. Because what it means in this industry is that you need to train your personnel, right? You need to come up with new ways of working in the actual healthcare day-to-day -day business if a system starts to offer new functionality. So this is this is completely different from being in the retail e-commerce e domain where you just need to get stuff out as quickly as possible. You can do A-B testing, that sort of thing. Um, can you actually deploy from the current state of the development branch? I'm currently working on this integration platform where I can do this. And it's super nice, right? Everyone loves to be able to do this because we either work on new functionality, typically, that is not really interacting with any of the things that we have in place already, and then it's fine to ship it to production if it's, if it's not going to be used yet. Uh, or we make small uh, changes that are easy to test. 
for that, it works really well. But I've seen plenty of systems where it actually makes a ton of sense to say, no, we should stabilize some stuff before we actually take the latest and greatest and just push that to production. And it doesn't make sense to say, if, if that's the case, you're doing it wrong, you should have a better automated test suite, because it depends. It depends, again, on the system that you're building. Um, one uh, of the things that I found a lot is that it really changes the game how much you need to do to get something into production. If it's just code, it's easy. If you need to also incorporate things like database schema changes, that's harder, actually. Um, and if you're going to be pushing out schema changes for unfinished code, then you might actually need to change that schema a couple of times, even before using the feature that depends on those changes. That can actually be very tricky. It can even be more tricky if you're working on something like CQRS event sourcing, where you need to build custom commands and custom tools with every release. Um, feature flags, right, is another one of those things that it really helps if you either don't need them or you can use them to be able to just release what you have on master, trunk, main, whatever. But again, that's not always an easy option. It really depends on the type of system that you are developing. Governance and auditing requirements, we've had people from my own company actually working on a uh, credit card gateway where that was just a hard requirement to always have someone review the code uh, before it got merged. And they were with a, a team of three people, and they would typically pair program. That meant that two people would be working on the feature, and then there was one person left who could actually merge the feature. Uh, and if that person was not there that day, yeah, the code doesn't get merged. Now, obviously, that's not a great way of working. But sometimes you just have to deal with the cards that you're given, right? So again, um, it's important to think about your goals. Um, and obviously, I think making sure that you don't run into merge conflict hell uh, getting stuff integrated as quickly as possible, uh, making sure that you can automate as much as you can when it comes to getting feedback, to running your tests. All of those things are, I think, universally accepted goals. Um, but I think that something like trunk-based development is only one way to get there. Also constraints, right? We've been, I, I, one of the reasons I included this, this whole history of version control system that I've used is we're actually at the point where we have the most sophisticated version control system in the world ever invented probably that has super, super good branching uh, support. We, we can do automated merges almost without conflicts, especially if we structure our code well. Uh, but we seem to just ignore all of that and say, yeah, let, let's just pretend that we're still on CVS and everyone is just pushing on trunk. Right? It doesn't really make sense to me. So again, we, we see this, this, this change. And again, it, it can be a positive change because I think um, the continuous integration trunk-based development community, that's probably too much to call it a community, but the movement at least, um, they are coming up with very, very interesting things to make it work, right? There's, there's excellent stuff in there. Test avoidance, or only doing um, uh, incremental changes, uh, all of those things, I think, are, 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 are really nice. But it doesn't necessarily mean that this should be your goal, right? Again, think about what you want to achieve. And, and that's the final thing for that. I want to briefly discuss something called developer testing. Now, JUnit is the thing that started this all. And this is even older than, than my Java career. This thing was actually invented, I looked it up, in 1997 when Ken Beck and Eric Gamma uh, went to the Oopsla conference and they were on a plane together and they already came up with the idea for this. Um, it became popular around the turn of the century, quickly um, branched off into X unit projects for pretty much every language out there. And um, actually, um, later this conference, we have a talk on Spring uh, from uh, a guy called Sam Brennan. He's actually part of the current JUnit team, and he's working on JUnit 5, so if you're curious about that, make sure to be there. But um, this thing became very popular very quickly for very good reasons, I think. Extreme programming community immediately embraced testing as a, as a core thing, a core uh, activity of doing development. Uh, Test-driven development came out quite shortly already after the notion of writing unit tests to begin with, because people saw the value of actually writing tests at least together with your code. Right? I'm not going to go into the argument of if you should literally write your test before your code, because I have other opinions on that that I'm, I don't want to share in this keynote. Um, code coverage became a thing, because obviously if tests are good, we need to know if we have them and where we have them and where we might be lacking them. Um, and that, that sort of spiked the whole continuous integration. I think it's fair to say that you cannot do continuous integration without having an automated test suite, and everyone agrees on that. So this is just a good thing. 
Right? This is not um, something that people are still debating. This is sort of accepted universal truth. On the other hand, with everything that we do, every choice that we make, the return on investment is always what do you actually gain versus what do you need to put in. And this is something that we should always keep in mind as developers, especially as architects, as CTOs, as people driving the way that we develop software, always consider your return on investment. And it's, I really like this part, because when you go on the internet and you start looking at just some pictures of touted benefits of writing unit tests, you will just find everything you want. Um, so you can find this picture, for example, that says, yeah, actually what you see here is that uh, the earlier we find something, uh, the, the, the easier it is to fix, um, and it about doubles every time, right? Here we see that uh, every step uh, we go up one more factor. Uh, but when you look uh, again, you can also find this picture. This just says, yeah, it's mostly flat until we reach production, and boom, and then it says, you can find anything you like, because none of this is actually based on any real data, right? This is just people who have an idea, and they, they have their NS1 experience, and they throw it out into something. So this was actually on the blog that had a little comment there that says, if this doesn't convince you of the value of writing unit tests, <laughs> I, know, I don't know what will. And there was the hero of this presentation is this anonymous commenter. This is Blind Man. I have no idea who Blind Man is, but what he said in 2008 is he quoted that sentence and said, yeah, absolutely, I'm a sucker for nice 3D bar graphs that basically believe anything they tell me, and also brown eyes, because I could never resist them. This is exactly right, right? This is what happens. This is all this cargo culting where you can always find someone that shows, yeah, but it's going to be like 100 times more expensive if we need to fix this in production. And again, uh, th that's not my experience at all. It really depends. A bug that actually introduces something like let's say, a data inconsistency in third-party systems that you don't control, and now we need to basically redo the whole thing? Yeah, it's like that. That's not typically what a bug does. In my experience on my current platform, right, if we find a bug on production, which fortunately doesn't happen very often, even though we don't have 100% test coverage, but more on that later on, um, I can fix that bug, and I can have the bug fix running in production 15 to 20 minutes. That's usually actually pretty acceptable compared to what we see over here, right? How much effort do I actually want to put into preventing that from happening by having more tests? Also, um, there is this thing called the test pyramid that was coined by Mike Cohn in a book on agile development in 2009, where they said, yeah, you know what? We need to have mostly unit tests and a bit more service level tests and all the, all the way up to end-to-end -to -end testing because when we go up, stuff becomes slower, right? We have more integration, so if something fails, we don't really know what it was. We need isolated tests. And for a long time, this was sort of accepted wisdom. You may be familiar with this picture. Uh, you may think well, that it's actually a still from a movie, uh, but this is actually me. This is me trying to refactor code that has dozens and dozens of tests that hard code implementation details because someone thought it was super important to have a ton of unit tests. And now I'm finding something in the code where I see, oh, I can really make this better. And I spend an hour on making it better, and then I spend a day on trying to get the test to work again. And then sometimes I'm done after a day, and sometimes I just give up and say, nah, it's too hard. Um, and this is a, a common experience. Gavin King is the, the, the guy who invented Hibernate. He has a lot of opinions which I don't agree with, but here he really nails it, I think, when he said, um, tests can have false positives, where a change to an internal implementation that is a proper change now all of a sudden causes your test to fail. And if you have a lot of these, people will be de-incentivized to clean up bad code. And this is so true in my experience, right? And we don't talk about this stuff enough, because everyone thinks if tests are a good thing, then more tests are better, but they're not always that. How many code reviews have you done where people wrote unit tests and you looked at them and you said, you know what, you should just take out this test because it doesn't really add any value, it will just get in the way. Most of us don't really do that. I, when it comes to uh, writing unit tests, let me do a little confession here. Hi, my name is Joris. And uh, when I do code reviews, I don't typically treat tests as first level class citizens. So I'm already happy that there are tests and I don't really review them up to this level. Right? But that's bad, we should. We should do that because it's important actually. How often do you delete tests? Do tests keep on adding value? or do they just get in the way after a while? But this is not something that is a common practice, and I really think it should. 
You may be familiar with this picture. You may think it's actually a still from a, from a movie, but this is actually me in a project where we told the customer on every sprint demo, we're going to show you the code coverage percentage of our code base, and we're going to guarantee you that it's at least 80%. Why do we do this? Most developers don't even understand what it means to have 80% test coverage. Most developers don't understand what it means to have 100% test coverage because they think it means we have literally tested every path of the code, which it obviously doesn't. 80% test coverage means that you know, we probably did a lot of work to cover trivial stuff, and now we're going to tell the customer that we did a good job, and if we actually get it down below that, then apparently we've done a bad job and we need to get it up. I had our previous CTO once tell me a story where he was on a project like this. And he wrote a test that would use reflection to automatically test all getters and setters in the application code base for this. This is what you get if you incentivize people by saying, here is an arbitrary goal, you need to meet it. Of course they will meet that goal, right? But <laughs> test coverage should not be a goal. Again, what are your goals? Goals are not test coverage. Goals are, depends, right? Less bugs or maybe better uh, safety net for refactoring, right? You need to come up with that. So something that really resonated with me was in 2018, there was a blog from Spotify by Andre Shaver who said, well, maybe instead of having all of these unit tests that really focus on implementation details, we should focus more on integration. It's a bit of an ambiguous term. Integration test is not very well defined, but to me it means stuff like when I'm using a framework, I need to test things like the security. I need to test my database integration. I need to test error handling. I need to test transaction management if that's in place, right? And th those are the aspects that tend to be really important, uh, but that are not that easy to actually test in individual unit tests. Also, I think in the enterprise application development community, which we're not all in, but I think most of you are, we tend to overestimate the complexity of a lot of what we do. When I look at a lot of systems that we build, there is complexity in certain places, but a lot of other stuff is actually pretty straightforward, right? It's getting stuff out of a database, transforming it into JSON and putting it on some screen and then going the opposite way back. Uh, you don't need 100% test coverage for that sort of stuff, typically. You need to make sure that the mechanisms that you have for that are all in place, that they are well tested. And after that, you basically just duplicate what you have already, right? And it's, there's also this, of course, right? The internet is full with memes talking about the difference between unit testing and integration testing, where yeah, we unit tested this thing, but it's actually a slide door, and this happens a lot. Don't put false faith in unit tests. Think about what your goals are for having tests. And again, there, some of the goals, I think, are shared, right? Everyone wants to have less bugs, uh, but there are other reasons for having tests, and not, they're not the same for everyone. Also, do your constraints still apply? I talked about that, that pyramid where we saw that um, higher level tests are slower, and therefore you should have more lower level tests. Question if this is applies. This is Graham Rocher. He's the lead of the Micronaut framework. He's also done stuff on Grails in the past. And uh, one of the things that I think is very interesting about Micronaut is it focuses on doing a lot of stuff at compile time so that it needs to do less things when your application starts up. And that makes startup very quick. And I was actually looking for uh, something else that he said, and I couldn't find it. But basically what he's saying here is that um, a lot of these advices are framed as common best practices, but they are really framed around constraints that may no longer apply to your situation. What they found with a framework like Micronaut when they were developing it is that a lot of their tests became integration tests because it was actually fast enough to just write everything as an integration test. You don't really need that much unit tests with mocks or other test doubles anymore when you can just test the whole thing end to end. And this is something that I see a lot in the current industry, and it's a really positive change. Stuff like test containers actually ensures that we, we no longer need to do things like run against an in-memory H2 database, where we hope it sorts of behaves the same thing as the actual database we're using in production, because otherwise there is no way for us to run our tests fast enough, because that quick test feedback, that is important, right? No one is arguing that. But the reason for writing only unit tests and not integration tests is that we could think that integration tests are not fast enough. And for a long time, that was true, but things are changing. So if you're not looking into developments like this, if you just keep holding on to this old idea, oh yeah, I need to really just write a lot of unit tests with doubles for everything, you end up in a situation where we recently found ourselves in, where we took over a project from another company, 
and they had written like an alternative reality for the database layer. It was mind-blowing to see they had, for every repository, they wrote a fake implementation, but it wasn't just a stop or a mock. No, it was actually something that would keep track of data in memory and then try to replicate the database, and they were running all of their tests against this. You're not testing your actual production code if you're running that. You're testing an alternative reality that you created yourself, and it's, it's insane. But it's, but it's understandable why this happened. Right? If you think back about where these developers came from, what tools they had, what they were facing, you can think, yeah, it sort of makes sense, but to actually go this way is not, is not the right way. And I've taken three arbitrary examples here, because obviously um, this keynote needs to end at some time. But this, this sort of things apply to a lot of different things. In the past, people used to say you need to program to interfaces, where actually a lot of the reasons for saying that were constraints. It was because we couldn't proxy uh, we couldn't mock uh, concrete classes properly. Um, it's happening with services and serverless. Services versus serverless, right? There are good reasons for both, but you see these extreme sides being, being posed. It's about the right programming language, where typically the language doesn't really matter. It's the ecosystem, it's can you hire people, it's are there mature frameworks, it's, it's how sustainable is this in a couple of years, right? That's the sort of stuff. My prediction, soon enough at conferences like this, we will be talking about artisanally written code versus AI-generated code. What should we be doing? Are you still writing code by hand? You're doing it wrong. And obviously, again, <laughs> there are cases for both, right? So, th so this is what we see happening all and all the time. So, so now what, right? Should you just think, OK, this is the keynote I saw the first day of GoTo, and now all of these people that have a story here that says, this is what we found, and this is what you should be doing. Should we just stop listening to those people? And the answer is, of course not, right? All of these people here have a point. I was part of the program committee that made up this conference, right? All of the people that are here, we invited for a reason. They all have a point. Um, but what you need to do is you need to understand the context of people who speak at these conferences, who write these articles, who, who come up with this stuff, and then figure out how it applies to you. And that's a hard job. But that is your responsibility. No one else can do this for you. Um, this is actually a quote from me, but like I said, a keynote should be a bit more of a thought leadershiperish thing. This is not a very quotable construct, right? This is just common sense. So I needed to come up with something that was a bit more strong. So last year, I actually did my best to try to introduce a new, a new term, because I found out that a lot of stuff that I'm doing is not really cloud native yet. So I tried to come up with the term cloud expat. I liked it, but apparently it didn't really catch on. So just to close off, I needed to come up with a new term that I can now present to you here at GoTo 2023. So I talked about extreme programming, and apparently calling things extreme really helps, right? Taking things to the extreme, saying, yeah, you should just go all the way over there, all the way over. This is how it's done. So this is what I want to do today. So what I'm proposing here is extreme pragmatism. From now on, you will all be practicing that in your day-to-day -day job. And instead of just embracing change, you will embrace critical thinking and see if stuff actually makes sense for the context in which you are operating. So my name is Joris Kuipers. You can find me on Twitter at Jay Kuipers. Thanks for being here.